Hello, good morning from Nairobi, Kenya. My name is Lucy Mothoi. I'm really glad to be here on the Obehi podcast. And I'm passionate about film marketing and distribution. That is the area I work. And I'm really honored to be sharing my insights on this platform. Hello, and welcome to Obehi podcast. I'm your host, Obehi A14. And I strongly believe that everyone has a story to share. Now let's get started with this episode. So just a little background about myself. I've worked in the film industry here in Kenya and across the continent, uh, also in production and distribution of content. So we'll be diving deeper into what that entails and all the spaces I've worked that have taught me the insights that I have for the industry. Otherwise, thank you so much for having me and let's learn together. I was born and raised in a small town called Nyahururu, which is in the central province of Kenya and on the leeward side of Mount Abadeas, if you've ever heard about Abadeas, Abadeas Mountains. And it's a, it's a very cold town um, because it's on, first it's on the leeward side of the mountain. And also it's, it's, I think one of the highest points of this country. So we grew up in very misty mornings, rainy days, but that has changed over the years. I, I came to Nairobi 2007 to university to pursue a BSc in ICT management. So I'm also really good at coding, software management and development, and also hardware support. But I ended up coming to this side of TV, but I really do appreciate ICT as a field because it's always here with us and I'm always looking for innovative ways to incorporate in the works that I do. So yeah, um, that is my journey from Nyahururu. Nyahururu is a Maasai word. Uh, actually, most towns in Kenya were named by Maasai because they, it's a pastoralist community, so they're always moving to different points. Uh, some of them still do to date. So Nyahururu means falling waters. In, if you Google Nyahururu, you'll find a very beautiful waterfall, which was previously known as Thompson's Falls because, uh, well, the people back then used to name them, uh, you know, landmarks are, uh, behind, you know, their names. So now we are reclaiming back our, our names. So it's now Nyahururu Falls. When you talk about distribution, you're talking about how do you reach your audience and how do you reach your audience is a whole big conversation. And secondly, what is the purpose of this content and how do you ensure that you meet the purpose, whether it's to educate, you know, to entertain, is it a call to action? You know, is it advocacy? Are you looking to, you know, uh, create awareness on a subject and make sure that that, that particular subject is addressed? So in my case, distribution, I sum it into those two. And also the goal at the end of the day is to monetize, because if you're creating content, you have cast and crew you need to make, you know, you need to pay, you have new projects that are in the pipeline. So approaching film business as a, as a business is one of the, you know, uh, paradigm shifts that as a continent we have to face, because for the longest time, if you told your parents, I wanted to be a filmmaker, I wanted to be an actor, it was sort of seen like it's a hobby that you're, you know, you're thinking of getting into. But now it's, a, it's an entire industry that everybody is now starting to appreciate. And I guess that's where the Nigerian market got it right, because all the content that was seen there, we were seeing it as well here. And that's how the first thing is, I always say charity begins at home. If people are watching content at home, then it's very easy to export it to other markets. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen in some other markets. Like here, you'll find that someone will premiere their movie outside in Zanzibar, in, you know, in Cannes, in TIFF. And people at home have never heard or seen your film. So it's also about us creating a vibrant film industry in our own countries. And then, you know, trickling that down into other territories that we want to explore. And then right there inside also, there's a conversation about adaptation of content to different languages, to different formats, because what's happening right now, there's a lot of adaptation of content. So you get scripts from India, from 
Mexican, uh, Brazilian scripts, and then you adapt them for this market. And that's happening a lot uh, in some of the pay TV platforms. So we also need to ask, how will we build an industry if we don't have an inventory of our own content? So it's, is it also just about uh, you know, having a job that you're doing or how else do you also build a career that 10 years down the line, you can also have a catalog and say, hey, I've created a series, I've had two movies and what have you. So distribution in a nutshell just covers those aspects. And so I'll just sum it up it's in terms of reach, in terms of monetization, and the goal of you know the entire goal, whether it's to educate, you know, to entertain, or you know, uh, create a call to action. Uh, Nigeria started, or they, they, let's say, they pioneered the industry in the African continent, and other countries have also sort of understood that model. For instance, like in, like in Tanzania, you'll find that they also have their own Swahili films which they really love and there's an upsurge of bongo movies they call they call the industry bongo so there's an upsurge of bongo swahili movies ethiopia the same it's a very quiet country country but i visited and found that they had a very vibrant cinema culture there and you know every industry has its own unique way and some industries have still not yet understood do we use cinema as a mode of distribution you know, do we use television? Are our te television stations supporting us enough? For instance, here in Kenya, the Communications Authority of Kenya has given uh, the, the law or the policies that 40% of content should be local content. And so how do you define local content? Does news qualify to be local content? Does the in-house productions of the broadcasters qualify to be local content? Or is it what you acquire from outside, you know, from independent producers and other producers outside the organization, is that what now you call local content to support the industry? So that said, uh, I have a little understanding of the Nigerian business. And let's talk about how Netflix and Amazon Prime currently are you know, supporting the industry through ori Netflix originals. So in Kenya, I think we only have one Netflix original. And I saw in Nigeria that they're already in production with, uh, or even a film that was launched with Amazon Prime. So that said, I think it's staying consistent and also showing that your own industry supports what you're doing, supports the art, that supports the craft. Because if it's, an, it's a conversation about subscriptions, how many subscriptions are in all these countries? And what, what, are, uh, what is coming out of, the, of these subscriptions? Is it amounting to revenue for these platforms? So that would mean the support they will give the industry is much bigger than a smaller territory. Uh, I wouldn't say we are badly off. Uh, I've interacted with people from other countries where they are really struggling. They don't have a film commission. They don't have you know, proper policies that can help. So I would say we are work in progress. There's a lot to learn from each other. Even the Nigerian market has its own challenges. So if we can sit together and you know learn uh, from the good things that have worked, like in terms of mass distribution and mass consumption of local content, and then using those ideas to interact with each other and to you know to build localized solutions and local. Uh, policies that will help us to grow our industry and also exporting talent to each other, you know, do a collaboration between Kenya and Nigeria so that it's easy for a Nigerian to relate to a Kenyan story. So there's also that challenge of a lot of seg segmentation of our uh, content and content consumption. People say that there are over two, is it over two billion Swahili speakers in the continent? And that question is, uh, are they watching the same thing? Is someone in Congo watching what someone in Diaz, uh, sorry, Congo and, and, so, and Kenya and all the Swahili speaking countries? So we are very segmented, but how do we find a common goal so that we make use of the numbers that we have in terms of population? And secondly, the accessibility of the content 
uh, a lot of times you find that people will ask, where can I watch your film? So if you're launching in festivals, not everybody has access to festivals. So it's also partnerships with platforms that are able to reach masses like the government owned free to air stations. And also for them to support the filmmakers at least paying a license fee. So in terms of monetization, also the conversations have changed over the years. You'll find that they, we used to pay license fees when I was working in pay TV 10 years ago. That is so different now. Most platforms now are asking filmmakers to pay for airtime or they're asking for revenue share deals. I'm not saying any of it is, is a problem. I'm just saying that uh, collaboration and you know working as an entire ecosystem collaboratively, whether you're a pay TV platform, you're a content creator, as in from the time the content is created to the time it reaches the audience, it's a collaborative effort because if you create and the audience doesn't watch, then you there's no purpose of that content. You know, you you'd be having a lot of we have a lot of amazing shelved contents, content, uh, good movies, good series. So it's about time we find a way to you know release this content to people to watch and to engage with it. So, um, in summary, the industries are very segmented. I cannot tell you uh, similarities. It could just be in terms of storylines, but in terms of consumption, every country just has its own unique way of telling their stories and how people access the content. Thank you so much for that. Uh, okay, so that is about um, uh, your, your take on maybe what we can learn from each other, looking at maybe the Nigerian market and the rest of Africa. Thank you so much for that. Uh, but in terms of maybe the type of content that we should even create, because uh, I think now uh, for you as a creator, able to decide the kind of content you want to create for your audience is something, it's a kind of uh, liberty on your side. So how do we decide that uh, maybe mm, depending on what's all, what also the market is asking for? What do you want to say about that? That's a really good question because you create the content for the audience. So it's it also starts from you understanding the the audience. One challenge we have in terms of that is that we don't have sufficient data and research because if you're able to know how many people are in Kenya, how many tribes and what channels do they watch and it's like real time data. And if like, for instance, how some of the VOD platforms give you access to their back end so you're able to interact firsthand with what exactly people are watching. That is also a good way, but how many people are on those platforms? So if we're able to find a way that we can interact with our audience, understanding what they love, you know, their feedback. People use a lot of social media now. Thanks, thanks to social media, you're able to know if people are loving your, your show, they will engage with the cast and you know the cast and the crew on the social media platforms. So um I think if we have now that data. And it, uh, it's a lot, I, I know I, I worked with an organization that was working with Geopol and all these research organizations. And it was easy to know at this particular time, people are watching this. And also they could, they went an, an extra mile also to get the audience insights about the content. What did you prefer to watch? Did you enjoy watching it with your family? You know, those kinds of questions are very important. So it goes back to you understanding your audience and no one can do that for you. It's also calling on research uh, and, and you know access to data. So for instance, here in Kenya, we reached out to a couple of organizations who we asked that they can collaborate with the creators to know what the audience is looking for. Secondly, understand your client. If you're pitching to a free to air station or a pay TV platform, have you watched their, their channels to understand what is on those channels so that you don't pitch content that sort of is very displaced. For instance, probably they don't do lifestyle content, but still you can go pitch and say, hey, I think this would really work for a Saturday afternoon. So it's also how you learn to pitch. And also as a creative, you have to be pitch ready all the time because you're either pitching to get funding, you're pitching to a, a new platform that you think can take your content, whether it's an airline, a VOD platform, pay TV, all these spaces, yeah. so. It's uh, understanding your audience, it takes research and it takes you engaging with them. Yeah, and I've worked with an organization that 
really took research of the audience and under, understanding the audience very seriously. And so I understand how that helps in you reaching as many people as possible, you know, getting more partners, uh, partnerships out of those opportunities because even potential sponsors want to see numbers. They want to see, oh, we are able to reach 5,000 people. And, you know, and this, those numbers are really important. Now, how do you reach 5,000 people? Now, oh, <laughs> actually, I'm trying to say, <laughs> how do you sample the opinion uh, from the people? Is it like uh, you do a kind of a survey, uh, you put an, an app on, the, on where they are streaming so you know how many people are watching it? Yes. I think that might be important to know. Help me with that. All that. Actually, you can. I, I mentioned social media. I If you check, there's a show called The Sister Show. And they did their show purely on Facebook during COVID through Zoom and then streaming on Facebook. And they were able to get the organic numbers of people that were watching and from which countries, territories and all that. So if you're able to engage on social media, Secondly, if you're able to, you know, buy and adapt tools that can help you monitor, either by working with a VOD platform. And thirdly, if you have the budgets to pay for this research, audience research to be done. So there are different ways. And that's why I'm talking about collaboration. You may not be able to pay for your, you know, for, you know, to Geopol, to Ipsos, this big research organization. But if you have... Uh, organize associations across the continent that can help you understand how can Kenyan content be adapted in SA, you know, in, uh, in Nigeria, or I, I always like, you know, mentioning countries that we easily forget, you know, Cameroon, Zambia, Malawi, you know, how do we export our content into all these countries? So uh, collaboration and also, you know, using your own tools like social media, uh, just to know how many unique viewers do you have and how many unique uh, engagements do you have from the, uh, from the content. All right. And I'm talking of the unique viewer and the, and the people that are con uh, uh, consuming your content. Uh, what, what would you say about uh, kind of looking at Africa from, uh, with a bird-eyed view? How much are people actually connected to the grid? How much are they consuming this information uh, maybe mm. you can talk of uh, the Kenya films or maybe the films that are coming from Nigeria, from South Africa. How much are mm. the people of Africa actually consuming this information and what are they asking for in terms of what they want to consume? Uh, the genres that are really popular are family based, very light entertainment because people want, you know, after a hard week, after a hard day, just to lay back and, you know, watch something light and something entertaining with the family. Uh, comedies as well, but comedies, you know, it's a very difficult genre because the jokes in Nigeria may not resonate here, but that genre also is popular. And so I said family, comedy, and now uh, with all these uh, new uh, platforms like Showmax and Netflix coming, people have a variety to choose on what they want. So as I mentioned earlier, doing your research and understanding what the platforms are looking for. And you can always ask them, uh, if you're reaching out to Netflix, you can ask them, hey, is there any particular genre that you're looking for at this part at this time? And the, there's a time, I think a year or two ago, they were looking for, I think there was romantic comedies and sort of like uh, action dramas. So if you happen to have that kind of content at the time, you are lucky because they will consider it, of course, it, in the specified quality. Because also the other thing I should mention is that all these platforms have their selection criteria. So you, you just don't submit and think they will take your content. They have what they look, look for in terms of storylines, in terms of quality, in terms of it resonating with a wider audience based on what they are looking for. So that also is a challenge uh, to filmmakers and creatives to also understand not only the audience, but also the deliverables that are expected by these platforms. And that goes to the other point now on how to package yourself for marketing and distribution. If you've done a movie or a documentary or a drama and you're pitching it to these platforms and they accept it, there are other things they will need to you, need you to submit like a poster, a trailer, a teasers behind the scenes. 
you know, if you're creating content, know in advance some of these things so that you always, you're always ready to pitch to the, uh, these platforms. And secondly, create social media. It's free, create social media platforms, engage with your audience. You know, if you, you can borrow a bit of what happens in more advanced industries like Hollywood and Bollywood, they always like give, get us excited about a new show way before it's out. So they really invest in marketing and distribution. And I know you're asking how much should I put aside? I would say anything between 30 to 40% of your total budget should go to marketing and distribution because it takes a lot of time, uh, you know, doing press releases, attending content markets, attending film festivals, that's still marketing and distribution. So if you don't budget for that, you will have a really hard time, you know, getting people from different parts to understand and see your content. So, you know, be prepared from the beginning, start with the end in mind, as I mentioned earlier, by starting with the end in mind, you understand your audience and you understand the goal you want. If you want to reach 50 million children in Africa, that is the end in mind. How you do it? Is it approaching free to air stations in all these platforms? Is it going physically into those countries and you know, physically distributing the content? You decide that in the beginning so that you have a proper plan and strategy, whether it's for travel, whether it's to work with a distributor or an aggregator or a sales agent as some people call them, or is it for you to self-distribute? Because distribution is, is not just about engaging a third party, but also you can do it for yourself. So understanding the market and being prepared in terms of budgets and being prepared in terms of understanding of what the market is all about. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that, is, that is answered. In fact, I wanted to ask you um, what kind of liberty uh, the content creators in Africa have if they want to uh, maybe market their product to, to overseas. Say maybe, for example, mm -hmm. they, they want to secure a contract with Netflix or Amazon Prime. Uh, and yeah. I, I want to believe that these people have their own guideline, have their own set rule. They, they have their own, the type of content that they want to uh, send to, to their audience. So I think you already responded to, to that uh, well enough. Of course, if you want to add something to that, you are always welcome. But I'm sort of, uh, um, sort of curious as to how uh, maybe African creators or younger African creators should start. Uh, where should they start from in the content industry? Because... Uh, of course, they have a smartphone in their hands and they have story to tell. That is about what you really need to <laughs> some time, no? So uh, from your experience in Kenya or in other parts of Africa, where do you think they should start from in the content industry? Start where you are. And you may be starting from having zero budget, but you have these mobile phones that we are using and you have probably a small camera with your friends. That is where you start. Everyone's first movie probably sucked. But as you continue, you continue perfecting your craft. Start where you are with, with what you have. Write scripts, write stories, whatever concepts you have, write. And then partnerships, you know, those small partnerships, even from film schools. You've seen, I've seen some really amazing films done in film schools. So if you can just leverage on those partnerships because you cannot be cast director, producer, everything. No. If you notice the Hollywood films, they always have, it's collab very collaborative. And that's what I think we should also try to push for here to make sure that people are, you know, best, you know, fitted in whatever role they are really good at and always learn. There's always something new to learn. And there are so many masterclasses now being offered online the opportunities to learn from different professionals, connect with them and just tell them, hey, I need to spend a half a day just learning on ABCD that I'm having a challenge with. And uh, so yeah, learning, being ready to learn and using what you have. Like right now, there are so many festivals, uh, mobile film festivals. I've seen so many, even if you go to film, film freeway, you'll see a lot of them or one that's like 48 hour film fest. I was a juror for a seven day film festival. So these guys were given seven days to do everything, cast from pre-production to post. And trust me, we had a festival. So start in those kinds of spaces, yeah? As you dream bigger, as you connect with bigger people, 
And I saw like really amazing films. People really out there are very creative. People used what they had. Uh, a lot of them told us they just, I used my phone. I borrowed my friend's camera and uh, a friend edited the film. And they really did, if we, if we go check Seven Day Film Festival, there were some really good films there. And a lot of other stuff that Kenya Film Commission here in Kenya is doing just to encourage people to start where they are. So I don't think there's any magic around it. And networking, <laughs> your network is your net worth, right? So if you network with the right people, place yourself in spaces where you there are opportunities, there are you know, uh, areas of growth and areas of learning. Just immerse yourself in those spaces. I want to say something to the effect of the type of um, marketing that people can leverage in their content creation, uh, because I want to believe that there is more than one. So help me understand that. Something that's really amazing that's happening now is all the social media platforms. The content creation space has evolved. It has changed, it has evolved, and you have to move with the times. So what even uh, platforms are doing is they have a lot of presence on these platforms like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all these spaces where a lot of content is being shared. And you saw there's uh, a lot of demand for video content like on Instagram, people making reels because that's where the audience is moving. And also who are you targeting? It's uh, the youth. It's, you know, the youth, uh, the Generation Z, Gen Z are watching a lot of TikTok content. So I, I would say it's about aggregating these two spaces and understanding where your audience is sitting. So if you was, your audience is the ones who watch a full series and, you know, you can put snippets on TikTok, why not, right? So let's think of ways we can also make the best of the available mass audience that is on TikTok and on Instagram. Now, about storytelling, uh, we believe so much in storytelling in this podcast. Of course, I, I just uh, I'm about finishing a, a five part uh, uh, book series about storytelling uh, because I'm really passionate about it. I love it a lot. Uh, so, how can you leverage storytelling as a content creator? I want you to share with me some of your experiences. Please go ahead and do that. Something that just came top of my mind was adapting books into audiovisual content. And that's a subject I think we've been, we've been discussing a lot with, a, with some friends who are also authors. So how about all the amazing books that we used to read and converting them into you know, movies? And something exciting that happened is uh, what Netflix and UNESCO did uh, with the African folklore stories. So we have a lot of those. If you go to Nigeria, you'll probably come out with 20 million different stories because every family had a different way of telling probably the same folklore stories. At the end of the day, it's a story, right? So imagine all those stories that have not been told or even documenting your own family. You know, like there's a day I was just thinking maybe I should write a story about my mom and her journey. Like I could just picture a very beautiful story into how she grew up and how she ended up being a nurse, you know, starting a family with my dad. Those are all stories, as in we, but you can just be get, get inspiration from where you are or have a futuristic dream or vision, like flying cars and incorporating it in, 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 in technology. A, a few friends of mine went to Banilale this year and they visited some of the top studios there. And as we are thinking of selling our continent as a filming location, other people are, are recreating these locations with, te with technology. So storytelling goes hand in hand with our current realities, our perceived uh, realities, uh, future endeavors, future goals, the past, our history, you know, and yeah, even our history, come to think of it, all our founding fathers, you know, our heroines like in Kenya, Mekatilili, Wamenza, you know, the Mau Mau story, all these stories are, can you, as in, we don't even know where to start. So as we are creating love stories and all these you know, nice, beautiful stories, can you imagine all the stories that are probably somewhere in someone's script 
that is shelved somewhere. Yeah, so inspiration is all around us. In books, in our history, in our families, in our dreams. Thank you so much for that, Lucy. You see, the point, what I, uh, you know, I just said that I love story. Because, yeah, story really uh, is a fundamental for us to be able to live in this world. It's not just for marketing alone. It's mm -hmm. also about uh, survival. I remember in, uh, in one part of this book, uh, this five-part book series, I was making mention of the fact that, um, it's to, okay, it's true that we are concentrating on content creators and uh, um, small businesses uh, as the audience uh, in this in this book series but it's also not only about that storytelling is also about our heritage our survivor i was making reference to maybe the asian people in africa our ancestors who managed to survive because the new story story in the sense yeah. of knowing where they are coming from knowing where water is knowing where uh, food is and also knowing where danger is because yeah. without this key information you will die. So story is also about survivor. Story, of course, can also be used to conquer. Story can be used to mm -hmm. mali a people. Story can also be used to deliver a people. Story can be used to build a future. A story can be used to destroy the same uh, history of a people. So story is a powerful element that we all should master. And if we do, we can literally write our own check. So mm -hmm. I believe it's as powerful as that because it's enough to just look around you. There is no important uh, company or brand out there that doesn't leverage story in what they are doing. Think of Apple, Microsoft, Tesla, Google. There is no, no in fact, each of these companies I just made mention of, if you were to think of it, you just begin to read their story or hear their story because that is how we know them. It's not yeah. just by figure, by statistics. It is the story they tell. Why are they here? What are mm. they going to accomplish? So I think in this sense, it is very important that we understand storytelling. Because it helps us, of course, to be able to exactly. shape the future. Yeah, you want to say something there? Please go ahead. Yeah. Actually, uh, the, the issue of using film as a tool to educate, to, to, you know, to change paradigms, and even perceptions, because if you look at how the West perceives us, sometimes you're always in shock, like, wow, this, sometimes they still think the way, the way they think about us. Oh, these people wear clothes. Oh, okay. They don't hang up on trees and stuff like that. It's really shocking that in 2023, you still experience those things. And why is that the case? It's because we are still not continually telling our stories and taking our stories there. Take your stories to all these festivals in China, in Europe, and all the places that you feel there is a biased way on how we are perceived. So that's one. The other thing on storytelling, it can be just about anything. The other day I was just talking to someone about, you know, how social media has just changed the storytelling space. And um, so my parents have a small farm, and uh, my mom calls me and tells me, oh, the goat has, has gotten twins. Can you imagine if I'm just there with my phone, just documenting, oh, the twins, they are eating this and that. That's content. As in the things that you could have perceived to be so mundane, it's getting someone's TikTok channel, get, you know, people coming back, oh, that's really cute. And, you know, connecting the world. So let's keep doing that, creating clean content as well. Content that's going to inspire the generations after us. Uh, because that's also the danger of some of the platforms that you're seeing that these are sort of like an uncontrolled way of how all these things are being documented. So let's also focus and create content that can inspire and can teach. And this, this mod model of like behavior change, content creation or the impact productions, it's amazing because uh, there's, there's a lot of interest in that space now. I think every day I'm meeting a new person telling me, oh, I'm an impact producer. So I think we are still claiming those spaces where we'll create an impact, we'll create conversation, we'll ad use advocacy to, to educate. You know, people will learn different subjects, especially around the SDGs, you know, knowing what uh, 
subjects need to be addressed. Like now, there was a huge or, or a prolonged uh, dry season here in Kenya. And I'm, I saw someone who documented on their phone how the season affected them. Right here, just next to my place, uh, there's a small farmer who was plant. I helped to plant some maize. And on the two seasons that we planted, nothing grew because there was no rain. So do you, documenting how rain-fed agriculture may not be sustainable and finding solutions around that. And this is just documenting on your phone. You know, it also that's that puts you in a situation where you also really in touch with yourself, with, with your career, with what you're doing, because you'll know, oh, it didn't rain this year. This is a pattern. You understand the patterns. And then you can educate other farmers. So I think there's we are we're in a really amazing space where audiovisual content is used in very powerful ways. Even on in the big conferences, if there's a climate change conference and they always show probably a five minute film showing the impact of you know, emissions, the impact of uh, rains not falling in some part and how it, you know, it, it affects even the security. If there's no food, people are, are anxious, people are detected, everything just, prices just you know, go crazy, prices of everything. If you're talking about energy and maybe mining, how is it affecting the land where people were farming? So it's it's having those conversations and you know seeing how you can document them either into books and all that. So there's uh, that space of impact production and creating content that will impact people and you know will get you to think, will get you to change your mindset, will get you to do better. I think we should do more and more of that. Absolutely, absolutely. A good example would be maybe like um, you think about in Nigeria now, we are in the period of election, we are moving out of it uh, because we had election uh, last uh, last month and also the, the month before we are be, we are all be in the mood for it. Uh, what happened is that um, the Nigerian uh, youth, particularly those within the uh, obedient movement, of course, we are ahead of it, uh, they actually armed themselves with smartphones. And because of that, they are rewriting the history of Nigeria. Even those, those in charge of the politics are still trying to sort of hold on to power because they, don't, they are afraid of the change. But the change has already come. And the change uh, is that you can, write, you can rewrite your history. And that is in the power of technology. Like, what did they do? During the election, for example, white people are casting their vote. They are counting it. People are taking pictures, taking records, taking video, and they are sharing it. Now, what does it change? What it changes is that usually they will do the election. They are the ones that have access to the, to the data. They will tell you what is the result. But now what has changed is that people are seeing the result. In every polling booth in the country, people are there with their smartphone. So if you say after tomorrow that you got this number here, because the people have a... a a record of what has happened, it is difficult for you to manipulate the election. Of course, they still manipulated the election. That is why the case is a court in the country now, because there are a lot of evidence that show that that is not actually what happened. We saw what happened in my ward, in my uh, in my fully boot. These are the people that were counted. These are the number that we have. That number is not reflected in the election. What happened? So it, just to use that one as an example, that. You, as a storyteller, or you as a content creator, really do have a lot of power. Use it for your interest. Because now, okay, within the area of content creation also, we understand now that there is a lot of potentials around us. With the use of AI, writing is not going to be as tedious as it has been. But if writing is the only thing that you do, your job is already gone. You don't have any job. But if you know how to tell story, because AI doesn't tell story, it doesn't have the reasoning of how to pull the things together and tell the story like the human do, because it doesn't have emotion. So that is now left for you as a human being, as a storyteller or as a content creator to connect the dot. What is the missing link? If you can do that, 
then nobody is touching your work because you are organic. You are organic as a human being. Your reasoning is also organic. So if you give the same story to 200 people, you are going to get 200 results because each of these 200 people are reasoning differently. So I think it is important for us to leverage this big elephant in the room, storytelling. Exactly. All right. Exactly. Have, if I may yeah, add yeah, on that. Mm -hmm. So last year was part of a film project. The film is now on Netflix. The film is called Chaguo. You can go and check it out. So Chaguo was a project by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation, which is a German foundation, German political foundation. And the goal for this project was to create awareness around elections. Actually, it, was, it would have been so relevant probably also for the Nigerian situation, because like in Kenya, that we have a challenge of tribalism and the youth being manipulated to you know, to cause chaos and all that. So the story is, it's a very light story. It's a love story. And the two lovers are from two different tribes. And of course, one, and also there's one tribe, uh, they're the rich ones and others, they're the poor ones. So there's a lot of power play there. And also there's a lot of push and pull because of the tribe issue. And it just opens a lot of conversations around uh, even people choosing partners do you necessarily have to choose someone who's from your tribe even if you've met you've met someone who's from a different tribe and you like them and also the decision of selecting a leader do you choose a leader because they have a name from your tribe or a tribe that's close to yours so those conversations are ones that we need to you know to address through film and we did a lot of community screenings and had amazing conversations with communities on the subjects that were touched in the film. So I love those kinds uh, of films that, you know, spark conversations. And I love that you mentioned that. So that was Chaguo, the film. And there was also a documentary that was done also by the same foundation, but not the rule of law program. And it was about social justice. So this, this particular one was about two different communities, one in the Northern side of Kenya, where Lake Turkana is, and there's some projects going on in, in Ethiopia, Gibe 3 Dam, that were affecting the water levels in Lake Turkana. So that resulted in water levels going down. So there was the danger of people losing their livelihoods, those who love, uh, who depended on fishing and those who depended on economic activities around the lake and also they, you know, all these communities that live around the lake, you don't want to go intrude on the other people's space. So there was that. So issues of the government involving communities, even in the grassroots level, in some of these decisions and helping them and cushioning them on either the challenges that may come as a result of that. The other project was another one in Lamu. Lamu is in the coastal side of Kenya, the very extreme end that borders Somalia. And there was a project called the Lapset, which they dug a lot of coral reefs, meaning that a lot of uh, fisher folk lost their you know, daily income because they depend on fishing, they depend on you know, uh, the crabs and all that. So the same thing we are talking about, social justice, using film, just doc documenting these things so that when other people see this, they, are, they know that we also have a say or we also have an opportunity to speak up and this can be documented. And what I mentioned earlier about the guy who was you know, documenting how the rains are affecting his farming activities. So, so there's a lot of that. Or if there's a business person that you've watched grow over the years, you know, go ask them to give you photos of their first business and just do a five minute documentary. They give you insights of how it's taken to grow from this space to that. There also, there are all sorts of storytelling things that you can, you can do. Or a farmer just like outside my place, uh, transitioning from farming, maybe uh, horticulture to something totally different. You know, why, why do we, this is just for the income. Is it sustainable? Can it be adapted by other farmers and the likes? So storytelling is infinite. <laughs> you can, I can just talk about my hair. I can just say what, what the benefit of having my hair is and 
people are creating like uh, just on social media you'll just be amazed on the kind of things that some are even gross like someone <laughs> doing like uh, popping pimples and those you know <laughs> people just create crazy kinds of stuff and they have a huge 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 following and audience so absolutely because you, that is not if you're looking for no inspiration <laughs> i think you just need to stop and just look around you <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. There is no limit mm. at all. Now, in terms mm. of um, the marketing, what kind of strategy would you recommend for somebody uh, who is into content creation now uh, and maybe are looking for, um, call it some, some tips on how to mm. get out there and, and make money from what they do? Because what we are also promoting here is that people should look at what they are creating from the point of view of business. Because that is the only time it's going to pay you. Otherwise, it's just a passion. If it is a passion, mm. then the drive is really not there. So, okay, you can still create content for passion. That is fine. But what we are encouraging here in Obehe Podcast and in our business is to encourage people to look at content creation from the point of view of business. So, mm. help me understand that. Okay, I love that. Uh, it's not just about challenges, but also finding solutions to the challenges that we have and also exploring the opportunities that are endless. I've, I think we've seen that there are endless opportunities that we've not really explored and they are still open for us to, to go into. So some of the strategies, of course, I mentioned earlier is how you package yourself. Because if you find a platform that wants to invest in your content and you've not you know, prepared the sufficient marketing materials, uh, you're putting yourself in a really tight situation for failure. So start with the end in mind. Who are you targeting? Is it children? Know the research behind that. You know, how many children, where are they? What languages do they speak? Uh, you know, which platforms are best to approach this, these children? So the research side, how the strategy is the first research, second, how you package yourself, and third, going into the market, whether it's in the festivals and, and contacting the platforms, pay TV, free to air, airlines, to name but a few, attending content markets. Those are some of the ways to, you know, to, uh, what is it, market yourself. The other thing, if you're using cast and crew, make the best of them. Because if you, like for our film, we had about 250 cast and crew. Imagine if all of them created a buzz about the film on their own social platforms. Like myself, I have probably 20,000 followers on whichever platform. And I put it out there, everyone would be like, oh, what's that? Of course, not all of them will watch it, but the numbers will, if, if someone shares and another person shares, it means that you have, you've already started in-house. So let's also be supportive of the projects that we are in. Don't just get paid and leave. And also, I hope the situations of the working conditions are also good so that when you ask people to help you with marketing, uh, even if you're not able to pay so much, at least they can help push the brand. And where are they pushing it? Make sure that you have proper posters. You know, if you see on Netflix, you'll see that a lot of uh, films usually make two, three posters so that even when you go back later, you'll think it's a new film, but it's the same film just gives you that perception of, you know, of it, freshness, it no? Exactly. So if you had watched the film, you may even be tempted to open again because there's a fresh new poster there. So try do the same, create different posters so that they can also be used for marketing. And as we said, budget for it. So we said we are starting with the end in mind and we're also th approaching film as a business. This is a creative economy. This is where we make our money from. So when you approach it from that, how do you do it? If you're running a shop, you always budget, you always take stock of what's happening. You know, you pay your employees. You always understand what are the new products in the, in the business and who are the competing shops. So look around, look around at, at what other people are doing. And also uh, there's a word, Swahili word we say, jitume. Jitume means put yourself out there. Because if you G2 have a project me. and you hide G2 me, G2, G2 me. me, yes. So send yourself or put yourself out there so that people can see your work. And you do that by you have social media, 
you you know the part of the marketing budget can also be some media appearances uh, get some vlogs to write about you you know it's it's all about how you put yourself out there and you can also if you have some budget you can also put uh, you can also pay a pr company i've seen a lot of them coming up now so that they can also take professional photos of your cast and crew you know they can you know document all your marketing materials properly so that you know they help with all those media appearances and it's a progressive process people think distribution comes in the end no it never ends it starts when you're doing your pre production because even when your team is doing the table readings for scripts document those process those the, the process when you're doing casting document it because there's an audience out there even for people who love watching behind the scenes like myself i really love watching behind the scenes just to understand some of the things that went into creating some like some popular scenes or you know some locations especially if they didn't even use a you know if they were doing stunts you want to see how they did those stunts so be creative and also most um, making multiple use of the content for instance if uh, you're creating like a lifestyle show and you have a celebrity there they can talk about you know how to apply lipstick for the day for the night and that can be used as other forms of content uh, like filler materials or what they call interstitials so make the best of make the best of everything that that is there i think people forget they get too caught up in lights camera action and then forget to even take pictures when the cast is in action you know uh, because it, people will be on set the whole day and then you remember oh i didn't take pictures telling them <laughs> to pause once again for a scene when they're tired it may not bring that mood so let's say it's a heated argument the there was tears involved capture that moment so invest in all these things and it it just calls for proper planning when you're planning for the budget when you're planning for the you know daily activities you know that you need a photographer on set you know take pictures of on videos of, of the makeup artists of the set designer doing their thing that's all content for creating marketing creating a buzz and you know having some sound bites some teasers let the cast and crew recommend people hey you need to watch this this film i'm really excited to have been part of it so get them to also get excited about your project treat them well on set so that you know it will come very effortlessly for them to do that for you and plan a good premiere event you know uh, plan something grand plan community screenings for engagement partner with organizations touching on the subject that you're covering. So let's say you're talking about climate change. There are so many organizations, so many uh, workshops, so many conferences talking about different subjects. So look for these spaces so that you're always, your film is always in, in conversations. You know, people watch your film and they sit down and discuss, yeah, from this film we've learned ABCD. Yeah, so that's, uh, those are some of the strategies I was, I'll propose you. And those are really highly valuable strategy. Thank you so much for that, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, um, how can people connect with you? Those who want to do business with you, please use these few seconds to promote yourself. You need to do that. <laughs> All right. So I'm really excited right now to be working with the Sotambe International Film Festival, which rebranded to now it's called the Zambia International Film Festival. And they are planning the first ever content market there called Z uh, the Zamif Business Arena. So the market is called the Business Arena. And the vision is to create an ecosystem where also filmmakers from different part of, parts of the continent can monetize their content in different regions. So we'll, we'll be having amazing conversations with different filmmakers, with different stakeholders. We'll be talking about how to monetize content how to protect your, you know, your content, understanding the media laws in different regions of the continent. It's an intense program that we'll have. So the event will be on the 27th to 29th, that is the business arena, but the festival starts from the 23rd to 30th of September. So if you're planning to come to Sotambe, uh, the film festival, I, I think the call out for submissions is still open. So submit your films to Sotambe Film Festival and also purpose to attend the business arena content market because we have a lot of great things lined up lined up for you yeah so i'm 
currently in that space of organizing and curating uh, content markets and film festivals and curating also workshops. So I'm doing a lot of trainings as we speak. Uh, I think when we last spoke, I was, I was working for an NGO, but now I'm back into consultancy, which is what I really, really do love. And yeah, I think we can connect more even on LinkedIn. Uh, my LinkedIn name is Lucy Modui. You'll see their media specialist. So I just call myself media specialist because there's a lot I do in this space, not only in marketing and distribution, but also in terms of trainings and production and what have you. So yeah, let's connect, let's network, let's learn with each other. Um, yeah, invite me to your country to come curate a workshop. I'm always you know, doing this in different countries. And yeah, I'm looking forward to conversing with all of you. All right, now, how would you conclude the conversation? Maybe there is something uh, you need to say. I didn't ask you or just a kind of uh, <laughs> a final thought. <laughs> so go ahead and okay. do that, please. Okay, so I think my final words of wisdom <laughs> would be to advise our creatives across the continent to start with the end in mind. And this means that you always plan on where your content is going to go and who it's going to reach who it's going to impact and how it's going to make profit out of it because we are talking about film as a business. So having that end in mind will position, position you in a way that you're able to create proper uh, pitch decks that you can reach different sponsors to help you. Also in marketing, there are sponsors who will be willing to help you market, to help you reach different markets. Secondly, researching is very important research your audience, research your, the architecture of the business across the continent. And also third, put yourself out there. By putting yourself out there, you understand the different people doing what you're doing and you can partner with them. I think that that would be point number four is on collaboration. So you can't do everything as a creative. You may, want, you may be tempted to so that you, you know, sort of reserve some income here and there, but that collaborativeness is a collab those collaborations will really help us grow the industry because it will help us to, you know, have someone vouching for your content in a content market in any corner which uses different languages. And I think something we forgot to discuss is the adaptation of content into different languages because that's something that's increasingly getting into, uh, you know, there's a lot of demand for adapted content. So. Look, look at those companies that are adapting and you know, experiment. You can start with that one episode and, and sell it. And that's how the telenovela companies made all the money they made because by the time they're bringing their novellas from Brazil, Mexico, Philippines, Korea, we have all those things here and Arabic ones. They're bringing their content here and uh, by the time they get interest from two, three broadcasters, they already have set a budget for adaptation. And you can imagine they're adapting over 150 episodes into English. And now there's even demand for adaptation into our own vernacular languages. Like here in Kenya, there are two, there, there's an, a Bollywood soap that's being adapted. So question is, can that be done in Arabic countries for our content, right? So pick a drama from Nigeria, adapt it for, an Arabic audience or a Chinese audience. Uh, so I think these roles need to now get reversed. We need to get our content being appreciated everywhere, not just by us, because also even by us, we need to appreciate each other's content. So that, that, those would be my final conclusions and looking forward to connecting with all of you in content markets, in these online spaces. And I love that the internet, we're embracing the use of all these platforms and you're able to connect from whichever region. So thank you so much for having me and let's thank talk so and let's engage. Thank you, I appreciate that, I really do. That's been an interesting conversation. If you enjoyed this podcast, make sure you subscribe so you never miss any of our future episodes. Rate and review Obehead podcast and share with your friends who might need it. I remain Obehead Ewafo. Thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you in the next episode.